All right, it's Sunday night. HBCU alums and black college football fans, and welcome, welcome to another episode of the Black College Experience Podcast. I am Derek Thomas, one half of your HBCU team in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and the founder, queen, and CEO of Black College Experience is also in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, celebrating her alma mater's homecoming, the wonderful, awesome, 40 under 40 award winner, Keisha Kelly. Thank you so kindly. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, God, I can't say it enough. It's, it's great to be back home. It's great to be back in Baton Rouge. It's always a great time to be among uh, friends, what I consider family, alumni, my co-hosts, everybody. It's always great to yeah. be back. And everybody has welcomed me and has been so welcoming uh, to me this weekend while in Baton Rouge. It's been um, it's been it's been very good for me. I've been here since Wednesday. I'm getting up out of Baton Rouge on tomorrow because it's like I've been here almost a week. So I'm getting up out of Baton Rouge on tomorrow morning. Uh, as God's willing, traveling grace. But it was a, indeed a good a great weekend. Of course, on my side. Um, if you're rolling with us, make sure you call in. If you have questions you want to talk to us, if you have something you want to say. We're at 719-373-6861. That PIN number is 49170. Again, that's 719-373-6861. And that PIN number is 49170. Of course, you can catch us on Spreaker. You can catch us on Apple, Google, Spotify. What am I missing? Uh, Cash Cash box. box. If you're an Android podcast user, podcast addict on Android. And then iHeart Media. We're all over the place. So let's just go ahead and hop into this weekend because a lot of great things happen. Some near death for some of us, but some great things happen. Yeah, I I see you losing your voice too, lady. Oh, my goodness, I I am. I truly am. (laughs) And I want to welcome my line brother, Patrick Perry. He calls in every week. What's going on, PP? At least two of y'all had a good weekend. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Boy, what? We uh, we had a good weekend basketball season though, so we'll get to that. All right. So um before we jump into football, um of course we know uh money for our HBCUs uh, and, and funding for our HBCUs is something that's very, very near and dear to our hearts. And when we have to cut off uh an athletic sport to save money, uh, that hits home for me. Um you know, FAMU, of course, you know, uh, their athletic director uh, resigned and they're having some financial troubles in the athletic department. They have cut two sports, and those two sports are men's tennis and men's cross country. I uh, will be eliminated in June 2020 as part of the plan to banish the athletic department's budget. So um, we're not going to spend too long, too, too long on this because me and PP both know, uh, coming from a financially yeah. challenged HBCU, uh, losing sports is something that, you know, it's something that we don't want to do. But, of course, you got to have the money to to run your sports and provide adequate resources. Uh, Keisha, what do you think about um, this situation with family? This is just another slap in the face to family with the amazing football season they're having. Now having to cut these two sports off. And, and it's like you said, you, you hate to, to uh, cut the sports off like that. And the way that I always looked at it is that, you know, there are there are kids, there are students that play these sports, be it tennis, uh, be it soccer, be it bowling, be it um, be it something like golf. The ones that are that do not generate as much as revenue as your football, your baseball, your basketball. There are still students that come to school on scholarships, and anytime you cut those those programs, that means that that's cut also in scholarship money. And that trouble that could trouble a, a student as far as you know education and attending the university. So we know where there are budget cuts and things are being cut, and you're cutting certain sports. Exactly. Then you're cutting the chances for students to come in and not only to play a collegiate sport, but also to come in on the academic side as to where they were paying for school. Now they might have some kind of issue as to where they can't pay for school because they were dependent on that scholarship. Exactly. And to just continue, you know, to pull those things away. I don't, I don't think it's fair, especially when you look at something like tennis. In, in certain aspects, 
tennis is really good, uh, big. Tennis, uh, you know, in certain schools, you look at your or your Morgan State or your Howard University, you know, and a lot of people don't understand is that it's a lot of people that um, it's a lot of money and a lot of scholarships in tennis, but people don't take advantage of it. And if more people would actually take up the time, learn the skill, and learn how to play tennis, there are more scholarships being awarded, but people don't take advantage of the scholarships or try to get the scholarships because they don't even know that so much money is pumped into tennis. Exactly. And we just have a, another caller pop, pop in. That's That was your homecoming rival for this past weekend, uh, the wonderful Jennifer. What's going on, Jen? Hey, how you doing? We're doing all right. Are you on your way back home from Baton Rouge? I am. I'm probably about 60 miles outside of Houston. Yes, indeed. And Jen came down. Jen, you know what? I forget that you're in Houston. So in my mind, I was like, Jen rode the bus from Huntsville with the Alabama a &M people to come see the game. Uh -oh. I forget that. <laughs> Uh -oh. I forget you're in Houston. I forgot you're in Houston. <laughs> I know over the last, oh goodness, over the last two weeks, I have probably driven, I would say, close to almost 3,000 miles. Uh, supporting your bulldog. Supporting my bulldog. I'm tired. <laughs> I am. Uh, yeah, I was between between two to 3,000 miles, at least two. Well, well, since oh, you man. since you called, then we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and jump on this game, then, because we know we want you to be able to pay attention on the road. Now, yeah. uh, the game that we're gonna talk about is, of course, Keisha Kelly's Jaguars against Jens Alabama and them Bulldogs, and it was a back and forth battle. Every time the Jaguars thought they were getting ready to put those Bulldogs away, the Bulldogs came back. The very next play, they thought the Jaguars thought they were a gunner. I don't know if y'all remember that song from when we were kids, but the cat came back. That's how it was. That's the kind of game it was. Because every time Southern scored, the Bulldogs came right back. Came right back every time. Until Bulldogs kicked the field goal, and then Jaguars scored a touchdown to win the game. But, you know, let's get some, some responses from our respective alumnas of these universities. Keisha Kelly, this was your homecoming. What was your, um, you know, what was your opinion on the game and the outcome? Well, I, I always, I'm always careful to say, and I say this wholeheartedly and respectively. You know, Alabama A and M raised me. Southern University made me. It's a true statement. I, I, I've only known maroon and white my whole life because I'm from Huntsville, so I spent most of my time on the hill. We grew up on Alabama A and M. Every Magic City Classic, every football. When they, when we were back, they were back in the old gym playing basketball. We were back in the old cut when it was old Alabama a and is what we considered it. So, you know, to see it was historic for me because you get to see all the people, all your friends, everybody that's out of town coming to town, and you get a chance to check out the old alumni and everybody from church and everybody's looking for you. You get a chance to check on everybody. And everybody wants to see what you're doing and how everything's going. So you get a chance to <clears throat> kind of check in with everybody. So that was a good thing. Now, as far as the outcome of the game, <clears throat> again, I can't take anything from Alabama a and &M. My Jaguars were successful in doing this, but you can't take anything from them. When you're looking at the yardage and the rushes, you can't take anything from Akil Glass. You can't take anything from Jordan Bentley. Because even dealing with, uh, Jenkins being out for the rest of the season, we had a season-ending injury, they still dominated and did what they needed to do. And I did. I, I literally said this game went from 7-0, 7-7, 7-14, 14-14, 7 to 7-14, to 21, 21-21, 21-28, 28-28, 28-31, 31-35. To to That's how that game played out. Yeah. And it's just like you said is every time Southern scored, a and them had an answer for it. It was like an answer to it every time. And at that point, I was like, maybe I need to just go sit down. Because I feel like, <laughs> like, like, damn, like I should just go sit down. Because I feel like it was like, it was just bad. I'm talking about open plays. It was just bad. And I'm like, you know, you, you do. Sometimes or more times than once, we forget that. I forget that I'm on the sideline. And I'm like, yo, 
let me go sit down because if I start to say the wrong words, then somebody going to get in trouble. But it was it was one of the best games I've watched this season. One of the right. best games I've watched. Then your your response. I mean, I I can't help but agree. Uh, it was actually me going to the game was a uh, last minute decision because I well not last minute I um I had just spent all this uh, time, energy, and money at uh, Magic City Classic, so I had you know this time you know already on my calendar, but I was like I don't, I don't know if I'm you know if I'm going to be too tired to make those back back trips, but. Um, I booked my hotel on what's that Tuesday, Wednesday. I was like, all right, cool, I'm going. But um, it was worth it. Um, I know, um, as you know, all of us are, you know, pretty present um, with uh, the media boards and discussion with fellow alumni of, of, you know, all the sweat schools. And a lot of outsiders, uh, not uh, really Southern laws, a lot of outsiders were like, oh, you know, a and was a rollover, Glass is not going to do anything. Um, and so, now Southern, definitely, uh, Southern alums, you know, they show respect. It's like, no, you can't count them out. And with that said, I was proud of the performance that my Bulldogs did in a very hostile environment. Let me tell you. <laughs> Uh, Mumford, <laughs> Mumford Stadium on homecoming is not the place that you want to play in. It's not. Um, but my uh, my Bulldogs were literally on half to, you know, for the winning touchdown, but Kid Glass got sacked in the, um, in the final seconds on the final play. So, again, it did not turn out in our favor, but, again, one of the best games I've seen this season. Uh, I'm proud of the effort. I'm definitely proud of the poise that the offense uh, showed, especially with a, um, you know, that last minute, like we had a few seconds on the clock to try to drive down the field. That was, I was proud of that offense that showed maturity. Um, Mm -hmm. The defense uh, grew up a little bit um, yesterday um, with some goal line stances. But um, I, again, then I turn out in our favor, but I am proud of the effort that um, my Bulldogs face. But I do have to shout out uh, Skelton. That Skelton oh, is a grown man. Yes, he is. Skelton is a grown man. I, you know, I gotta, I gotta shout him out. He had so many rushing yards, and um, absolutely. And, and I know, you know, at Southern, like right now, Southern he is. In the drop in the West, uh, I expect bigger things from him as the season progress. Um, yeah, Skelton is he's a grown man. He is a grown man. Got to give him his credit. Yes, indeed. Now let's go down the stats for this game. And Keo Glass, three hundred and fifty-six yards passing. Four, caught him four touchdowns. He was sacked twice. Uh, Jordan Bentley ran for seventy-one total yards. Through the air, uh, Abraham. Am I saying his name right, Jen? Uh, Abraham. I think it's Abraham. Okay, he caught seven passes for 128 yards and two touchdowns. Xavier Moore had 89 yards and also two touchdowns. Now for the Jaguars, it was the Ladarius Skelton show. He threw for 198 yards, two touchdowns. He ran for a total of 30, uh, 277 yards, but he lost 39 of them on sacks. So a total of 234 net yards and two touchdowns. Jamar Washington uh, had 42 yards rushing. Devin Ben had our scoring rush uh, through the air. Hunter Register, 95 yards and two touchdowns. Defensively, uh, Armani Holloway led the way for the Bulldogs, followed by... Trenton McGee, they had 14 and 13 tackles, respectively. Kelly also had 12 tackles and one sack for the Jaguars. Calvin Lunkins, 13 total tackles, two tackles for loss, followed by Caleb Carr uh, with eight tackles. And then Tamari Smith, four tackles and one tackle for loss. So this was a thrilling game, back and forth game. And that's the kind of game you want to have uh, in a game like this. A homecoming game, a pet crowd, 
uh, two offensive juggernauts of, of uh, teams with quarterbacks that play the game very differently. And it was just a thrilling, thrilling game. And, and Southern able to win homecoming this year uh, because, you know, no last year they lost all corner homecoming. So it was good for Southern to pull out the victory for homecoming. All right, so moving along in the SWAC. Our Delta Devils got shut out 27 to nothing by Alabama State uh, a week after you know, having an offensive outpost, outburst against Texas Southern. Um, yeah, me and PP's weekend was not good at all in football. Uh, don't have to talk about the, the Delta Devil offense at all, but I definitely want to give kudos to the Hornet offense and definitely their defense. Uh, Davis threw for 199 yards and one touchdown. Ezra Gray had 70 yards rushing and one touchdown. Uh, Jahab Booker, 91 yards and one touchdown. Um, defensively for Alabama State, they had three players with seven tackles apiece. Cub, Pepper, Booker, and Adams each had seven tackles. Each had one tackle for loss. Devin Booker also had a sack. Uh, defensively for our Delta Devils, Tracy Tompkins led the Delta Devil defense with 11 tackles, three and a half tackles for loss, a half a sack, a forced fumble, and one pass breakup. All right, and another big game. Another. Well, what do y'all, do y'all want to talk about our shutout, or can we move on? Well, honestly, all I want to say is I was pulling for Valley. I was too. Man. I don't think anyone is more disappointed than I am. Uh, you know, they lost to Alabama State, who they should have as a bulldog, I was pulling anyone. I love a and and whoever plays the whole family thing. PP, I don't know you were at the game. Do you have any comments or suggestions for uh, what I'm, we need to do? You know I've been giving this same stat line everywhere I've been. Nine for 33, 72 yards. That's all I got to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <sighs> and then, and then yeah, yeah, go to the next game, yeah. <laughs> on, on to the next. All right, and another big game, um, which, you know, uh, was a shocker, a resurgent Jackson State Tigers team uh, defeated the upstart Arkansas Pine Bluffs, who early in the season looked like a Swack West favorite with the offensive numbers they were putting up, but... You know, they seem to be faltering late, and Jackson State has now won their third straight. Um, they they defeated uh-huh. UAPB 21-12. to Keisha, what do you think about Jackson State's third straight win? Well, we you know, as, as if we look at it, on the east side, Jackson State has not had a win in season in a couple of seasons. So I say this, this is the same thing with Jackson State as in Grandpa. They're getting hot at the right time. Mm-hmm. They're getting hot at the right time, at the right moment. They're getting hot. So now it looks as if, and it, it's it's some crucial games coming up here here soon. Some really crucial games as to where Jackson State can still be can still be a key component of of looking at like what they could do in the West. But of course, it's going to depend on if they beat Southern, if they beat uh, Alabama A and M. So it's a couple of ifs in there. Not saying that they can't do it, but it's a lot of key games that, you know, they'll have to do. But going three straight is, is big for Jackson State because they haven't had a win in season in so long. And it's like they're getting hot at the right time. Exactly. And UAPB is faltering. PP, any comments for the uh, for those tiggers? Uh, I – we have to apologize to the SWAT for letting them get this way. <laughs> but for real, they, yeah, uh, it's not surprised. I'm not actually not surprised at this because they showed that it's capable. They get, they're capable of doing this and they're just getting hot at the right time. Schedule looking favor. I mean, it's not going to be easy as far as we seen what glass could do and we seen what skeleton can do. So that won't be easy. Last year, we probably saw those games like, okay, that was a blowout. This year, it's going to be like, okay, Jackson State is seem like they're heading in the right direction as far as what Hendricks wants them to do as far as running the ball and playing good defense. And they're, right now, they're doing both. So right. I and, have to give them their props on that. And Jalen Jones, you know, had his best game in the Tiger uniform. 
threw for 162 yards, ran for a touchdown. He ran for 44 yards and a touchdown. Keyshawn Harper ran for 82 yards. Um, for the Lions, Shannon Patrick had 227 yards passing, one touchdown, three interceptions on the ground. Omar Allen, uh, 98 yards and one touchdown. No Taylor Porter. I hope he's not injured. I'm going to research to see where he is. Uh, Receiving-wise for the Tigers, uh, Kennedy led the Tigers with 119 yards receiving and one touchdown. Uh, Josh Wilkes led the Lions with 117 yards, and DeJuan Miller had 48 yards and one touchdown. Defensively for the Lions, Jalen Stewart led the way. Ten tackles, two two tackles for loss, one sack for the Tigers. Uh, Keontae Hamilton had another big game. Eight tackles, one and a half tackles for loss, one sack, followed up by Justin Ragan. Seven tackles. He lived in the backfield. Four and a half tackles for loss. Um, and as Keisha said, this does improve Jackson State's standing in the SWAC. Right now, the Tigers sit at 3-1 and one in the SWAC behind the undefeated Alcorn State Braves. And the final game that we're going to talk about in the SWAC uh, tonight before we move on to the other sports and then on to the other HBCU conferences are those Grambling State Tigers, uh, a team that was picked to finish, what, third in the West behind? Well, they were picked second or third. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Third after, pre- after Prairie View. After Prairie View. Um, they kept the Texas Southern Tigers defeated. Uh, they now st- sit at 0-9, 0-5. Grammar improves to 4-4, 2-2. And Jeremy Hickbottom got loose. 268 yards in the air, two touchdowns, 185 yards on the ground, and three touchdowns. Grambling fans were calling for him to be benched a couple of games ago. I'm pretty sure they're happy he's still playing well now. Uh, Keelan Elder also had 62 yards and a touchdown. Kevin Dominique had a touchdown through the air for Texas Southern. Florida State transfer De- uh, DeAndre Johnson, 351 yards, passing one touchdown, two interceptions. He also had a big game on the ground, 133 yards, one touchdown through the air. Uh, Donnie Corley had 170 yards receiving and one touchdown so what do y'all think about Grammy? you know um you know they now sit at two and two in the swag west behind southern so they need a little help a lot of help to overtake southern uh in the swag west keisha since they're they're your biggest threat right now to southern getting to another swag championship game what do you think about Grambling starting to hit their stride when their fourth game in a row Okay, so it's just like Patrick said a minute ago. It's all about the scheduling now, all about the time and the scheduling now. So, you you know, I can't. Yeah, y'all won yesterday, but you won to a total. You mm. you won to Texas Southern. That's mm. zero and what seven zero eight. So that's not really <laughs> anything to brag about. We we beat them fifty five to twenty or whatever. That's nothing to brag about. Everybody didn't beat Texas Southern. Everybody. They ain't won one game. Exactly. So if all corn and Gremlin was playing and you said we beat all corn, I could see something different. Everybody has beat Texas Southern in this season. That's not a good example to brag about. Yeah, no, I can't take it. Yeah, they are hitting their stride again, just like Jackson State, at the right time. Mm-hmm. And I think at this time, you know, they still have some hurdles they gotta get over. But I think it's, it's going to be a it's, it's going to be a good Bayou class. Guess to where in the beginning I thought it would probably be in straight giveaway for Southern, but we've seen some of the difficulties Southern has faced right. during the season uh, on the offensive side of the ball, special teams. So we saw the things that they have faced as well as the things that Gremlin has faced. So it's going to be a good matchup at Bayou Classic. But again, at the same time, they play Texas Southern. Texas Southern hasn't beat anybody. <laughs> right. And Alcorn travels to Grambling this week, so, you know, how the outcome of that game is definitely going to determine how happy Graham fam, Graham fam fans are <laughs> after Alcorn leaves the hole, as they call Grambling's home stadium. Uh, the hole. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'll, say, been- I'll say this. Um, I'll say this. You know, Gremlin is had a rough start, a rough start to their season. But um, one thing I know, and I've noticed from personal experience, and I and I can go back to that sweat championship, the A&M had locked up 
and grab <laughs> grab the one at the last minute. I'm still hurt about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, a down gremlin is still a dangerous gremlin. Yeah, and especially especially in a hole that sometimes they're invisible. So now all corn has dominated the swag for years now. So it's so they are the heavy favorites. However, you cannot count gremlin out in the hole. Now if the game was in Lorman, I would you know I would say you know landslide six or six. But it's just something special about Gremlin in the hole that you just can't count out. So that one is going to be a good one. Yes, indeed. I agree. Uh, I agree. So we're going to take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back with more Black College Experience. We're going to talk about the upcoming soccer swag tournament. We'll be right back in 31 seconds on Black College Experience. I already knew that I was going to go to college, you know, from a young age. I definitely want to major in political science. After that, I'm going to get my law degree. Then I'm going to come back to Detroit, boost the economy, become the mayor or something, try to make the situation better for other people. I feel like I owe it to the city. I'm determined. It's, it, it's going to happen. My name is Justin, and I am your dividend. All right, we're back with more Black College Experience, and the, the soccer swag tournament is upcoming. Uh, I think it starts November 7th, and the brackets are as follows. Number one seed, Howard, will take on Keisha Kelly's Jaguars with a number eight seed. The number four seeded Alabama A&M Bulldogs, Gen Squad, will take on the number five, Grambling State University Tigers. Let's get this PDF to start functioning right. Number three, Jackson State, will take on number six, Texas Southern. Number two, Prairie View, will take on number seven, Alabama State. And and that's that's the bracket right there. So, um, uh, interesting, Alabama State is normally number one in women's soccer. Uh, a little bit of a change of the guard there, but that's what you want to see. You know, so the, the, uh, the SWAC championship, let's see here. Get this up again. Doesn't want to behave. But uh, it's going to be an exciting swag championship. I can't wait to see who's going to be crowned the championship uh, in, in soccer. So um, it's just awesome to see these young ladies uh, do well. Uh, also, volleyball uh, still steaming ahead. Uh, Sunday's games included Kells, Texas Southern Jaguars uh, playing against Texas Southern, Grambling against Prairie View, Alabama a and against Valley. And then Alabama State versus Alcorn. So, and then the women's volleyball track champ tournament is going to be occurring later on this month as well. So, the young ladies uh, like to spike and get kills and dig. Going to be vying for a swag championship as well. Um, a little uh, best. Go ahead, PP. Oh, got got to tell me where it's going to be held at. Oh, okay, hold on. Dallas campus. Awesome, man! Can't wait! Can't wait! You know, we, we, we need to have that. You know, we get some exposure for our for our dear alma mater. So, uh, also with basketball season, we're getting ready to start. Just want to run through um, the um, preseason teams right quick, and then we're going to jump into the MEAC. All right. Uh, the preseason player of the year is Devontae Patterson out of Prairie View. The preseason defensive player of the year is Javius McKinnis out of Jackson State. The predicted order of finish, Prairie View, it's predicted to finish first, followed by Texas Southern, Grambling, Alabama State, Jackson State, Southern, Arkansas Pine Bluff, Alabama AM, and Alcorn State, and then our beloved Delta Devils are picked last. But we got off on a good start, PP. Did you go to the game? Yep. So t- tell the, the, the listeners about how we whooped up on Tougaloo. Yeah, we got, it was looking kind of rough at first, you know. Uh, Hunter, you know, the coach's son, true freshman started, and he got off to a rough start. It was uh, Jordan Lyon out of Canada. He carried the team early. We trailed at half, 40 to 46. But then what Hunter started to go on, everybody started feeding off his energy. And we ran Tougaloo at the gym, uh, 98 to 76. Hunter had 30, I think. Lions had 28. And mm-hmm. Michael Green, I believe, had 26. 27. Oh, sorry. 
20, yeah. So that was a real good start as far as the past few years we've been kind of like offensively challenged. Mm-hmm. You know, and because we lost to Tougaloo last year in the exhibition. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to see how that interests and how you're going to have a freshman pretty much going to be leading the team and how they're going to feed off that. We go to Iowa State this week to kick off the season. So right. it's going to be very interesting to see how they start I mean, how they're going to progress through the season. Okay, Kells, how do you feel about they having your Jaguars at six in the swag? Um, I always say it's just predictions. Predictions mm-hmm. are just something that everybody has to do, but, but the game still has to be played. So you can predict them six, and they can easily go two or three. You, they right. can go one. We don't. We never factor in any player hitting their high point. We never factor in injury. So anything can happen. So. Like I said, it's just predictions. Um, we'll see if they live up to the hype. Will they go over? Will they be higher than six? Or will they fall lower than six? So, you know, it's just a prediction. Exactly. Uh, so let's t- let's look at the women's basketball. Um, and this is my second favorite sport next to football. The preseason player of the year offensively and defensively is Naya Mitchell out of Texas Southern. And the predicted order of finish, your Lady Jags, are predicted to finish first, followed by Jackson State University, then Prairie View, Alabama State, Texas Southern, Gramlin State, Alabama and Alabama A and M, James Bulldogs, our beloved Delta Devils, Alcorn State, and then Arkansas Pine Bluff, finishing at the tenth spot. So, Kels, uh, we know Coach Funches has has had a an amazing career at Southern, entering his second year as the leader of the women's basketball squad. What do you think about the Jaguar, Lady Jaguar, Jaguars being picked to finish first? Um, definitely, again, it's just it's just a prediction. But, uh, of course, based off of what happened last year and how you lead to a championship, it, you know, it's just amazing. You're talking about in the first season, so you're going into season two. So, you know, looking at new things coming in, um, it's, it's no surprise. But, of course, Jackson State – was also a, a strong team as well. So right. I think anything can happen uh, between these two coaches and these two teams. Anything can happen at any given moment. And it's, again, when teams hit their stride at the right time, because we know we often, know, in the beginning, often what you face is uh, OOC out-of-conference uh, teams. You face a lot of out-of-conference teams just to where, you know, when you get into that swag play, you get into that Alabama and them, that Valley Jackson State, you know, you're playing all your opponents for the conference, things shift and things change. So, again, I mean, happy that they're predicted at one, but, you know, last season is over. Now we got to see what this season is going to bring. That's correct. So now we're ready to jump over to the MEAC, talk about some MEAC football, because, you know, we just talked about the SWAC position battles as far as vying for a SWAC championship. And the one difference between the MEAC and the SWAC is the MEAC does not have a championship game. They go off of tiebreakers and in-season records. I would love to see the MEAC add a title game. I think that would be so awesome. But the first game we're going to talk about as far as I come is North Carolina Central versus Howard. Now, Howard's been struggling this year, especially after Kaylee Newton uh, decided to redshirt and then enter the transfer portal to, you know, go to his next destination. And, of course, we know Howard's been a program in turmoil with the allegations of, you know, improper uh, behavior by the head coach. But they're still fighting. And, of course, unfortunately, North Carolina uh, defeated uh, Howard 28-6. to Um Let's see here. Davis Richard had 214 yards and one touchdown, followed by Isaiah Titan had 77 yards and a touchdown. Jordan Freeman had 40 yards and one touchdown on the the ground for NCCU. Uh, Through the air, the Eagles were led by Deshaun Stevens with 50 yards, followed by EJ Hicks with 40, Ryan McDaniel with 42, and Latrell Collier with a 39-yard touchdown catch. Uh, for Howard, the quarterback now leading Howard, or two quarterbacks now leading Howard, is Quentin Williams, who threw for 105 yards, one pick, followed up by Ramar Williams, was 5 of 10 for 41 yards. Uh, Dedrick Parson ran for 35 yards. Josiah Crook ran for a touchdown on the ground for Howard. 
through the air. Kyle Anthony led Howard with nine catches for 52 yards. So, Kels, PP, Jen, what do you think about North Carolina Central the victory over Howard? Oh, okay. I was make sure I had to cut my mute off. Um, I think Howard. Um, Honestly, I think this loss was on Howard. I, I mean, I can't really speak on North uh, North Carolina Central based off this win. I honestly think this is a Howard loss. Like you said, their program is in um, turmoil. Only, I think, 1,000 fans showed up to the game. Um, and that speaks volumes. That um, basically, at this point, Howard's going to have to clean house and take control of their football program and get those fans and alumni back interested or you're going to see more of this. So I can't really say anything about North Carolina Central based off this win. We're just seeing Howard at the, um, Howard at the basement right now. Keisha? Yeah. Oh, I, Howard is – yeah, this season is – yeah, they, they – they, you can cancel this season for them because they're over. Central did what they're supposed to do. They had a better team and they just came in and took care of business. You know what I'm saying? But, yeah, Howard is – Hopefully they can whatever they got to do to get their situation back right. Mm-hmm. After how well they did last year, they got to they just got to do some soul searching as far as how they want to change turn their program around. So that's all I have to say on that. Mm-hmm. Now up next, and then for me, for me, for me, I think the situation is just like you said. It's not twenty eight to six. That that pro, that program is washed. It's it's just too much going on at this point from coaches and quarterbacks. It's so much going on in the program. It's a distraction. So it's like it's almost like they – I use the Atlanta Falcons as an example. It's almost like they're just defeated and they're tanking on purpose. It's, it's a, they're in a bad position right now. <laughs> the Falcons. <laughs> because if you look at when Kalen was there, it was – you know, you go from Kalen Newton and, and being UNLV to, to this right here. They're in a bad place right now. They're just in a bad place. So it looks like Coach Prince may have been the wrong hire after our Valley alum and our frat brother decided to uh, leave. Um, so I'm looking to see how long Prince will stay at Howard or if these allegations of improper uh, conduct from the head coach are true, how fast will they fire him? And and, 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 and I guess you can say hit the reset button on the run Prince era uh, at Howard. Um, up next, Norfolk State straight. Blank Morgan State. It's just been a, a rough welcome to college football for Tyrone Weekly. Um, the Morgan State Bears sit at, I think, 1-8 and eight right now. And it was another, another whooping um, from Norfolk State, 48-0. to zero. Uh, Norfolk State's Juwan Carter, 314 yards and three touchdowns. Uh, on the ground, Raycorn Smith ran for 142 yards. Kevin Johnson, 47 yards and one touchdown. Juwan Carter, 26 yards and one touchdown. Uh, through the air, Norfolk State was led by the Kendall James, 120 yards receiving one touchdown. Justin Smith, 70 yards receiving one touchdown. Sean McFarty, 47 yards. Tyler McKinney, 34 yards and one touchdown. Not much offense for the Bears, uh, but I'm going to give these stats anyway. Total five interceptions thrown by two quarterbacks. A combined eight of 26 for 75 yards. And, of course, those five interceptions on the ground. Only a total of 78 yards on the ground. LaVelton Williams uh, and Iman Parker ran for 36 yards and 24 yards, respectively. Just a total, total dominant victory by Norfolk State over Morgan State. Any questions or comments? On the slacking that the Bears took from the Spartans? No. <laughs> All right. Another, another whooping. Uh, conference leader and, I, and, and you know, FAMU uh, put a whooping on Delaware State uh, 52 to 30. Another awesome victory for the for the Rattlers who now stand at 8-1 and one and 6-0 and oh in the conference. Um Let's get these stats here. I hate they have them. I had to scroll all the way down. On the ground, Ryan Stanley had another awesome game for the Rattlers. And the way he's playing, he better get some consideration 
uh, for uh, uh, being considered in the NFL. Not necessarily being drafted, but definitely he better get a chance to showcase his abilities. He threw for 253 yards and four touchdowns. In relief, Rashawn McKay came in, threw for, threw for 51 yards and one touchdown on the ground. Uh, Bishop Bonnet ran for 48 yards, followed by Terrell Jennings for 45, Devon Kendrick with 41. Uh, for Delaware State on the ground, but they threw for 106 yards and one touchdown. On the ground, Hood and Bertrand ran for 120 yards and two touchdowns. But let's talk about this family program. I mean, this do y'all really feel like this is a wasted season for FAMU? Because they're undefeated. I don't. They defeated they're North undefeated. Carolina AT. They're undefeated, and they can't do postseason play. But I still think that it gives everybody the opportunity to see what kind of family we used to see. The family mm-hmm. that, you, that we've been waiting to come back into play. Like, we've been waiting on this family team to come back. So, in hindsight, I think it pushes them to be better so that they can well when they do get to play again. But I do hate the fact. Every time they play, I hate the fact that they're unable to do postseason play because right. it would once again it would have been great to see another opponent in the celebration bowl. It would have been great to see fans right. there, and I think it would have brought a lot of people to Atlanta. Depending on who, let's just say it was a hey, let's say it was a FAMU and a Southern, a FAMU and an Alcorn. No matter what, it would have been a different opponent. Yes. FAMU playing somebody would have been just I interesting to ice it on the table. AT. No offense, Aggies, yeah. but we're tired of y'all. <laughs> we're tired of y'all, tired y'all. Of if you're tired of A&T, you got to be tired of Alcorn. Oh, I'm definitely to tired of Alcorn. You know I'm they tired of Alcorn. Back back. Stick up both of them. Can somebody <laughs> please beat them so somebody else can go? Tired of Alcorn. Alcorn is like the flu of the sweat. You know, we got all we sick of them. We just want to get us a, a shot and let them go away. Um, but yes, I would love to see a family. And, and I know last week I, I, I said, you know, what if an appeal could be made just to let them play this year? I, I, I know that's something that's something that's far fetched. But if that was an option, I mean, I mean, you can appeal, maybe make the band for next year. You know what I'm saying? Or say, okay, you know, let us pay a fine. You know, like like they do uh, in in FBS instead of not letting them. You know, be um, kicked out of uh, postseason play. Let them pay a fine. You know what I'm saying? So that this team, because they really deserve to play for the celebration bowl if they went out. They really do. They they really really, really do. I will say this um, to pick it back off of what Tisha said. Um, could you imagine a Southern? Family celebration bowl. Well, we've already had a Southern family oh. game this year, so. Well, I mean, no celebration bowl on ABC. In front of us, that would be so huge for ABC football. Period. Right. So, um, even though yeah, they're bad from the whole season, winning out brings it kind of restores family to. You know, their original place as one of the giants of HBC football. Exactly. So, and that, you know, puts them in place. So, when they are, you know, eligible for a season, they'll come back with that championship mentality. And finally, yeah. somebody give uh, North Carolina ASP some, some real competition when it comes to getting to the flow. Go ahead, PP. Yeah. I get I guess it just shows, what is it, how, what is it, people were kind of doubting Willie Simmons at Prairie View. He hit, I mean, Sam Mueller's already hit that stride in the second, his second year, so that kind of gives him validation how, how people were kind of, some people were doubting him, saying is he, he was kind of like Dooley or whatever, so I could offer some mind, but he turned them into a complete team in just year two, so it's really a shame that they pro- won't be able to go to the celebration bowl. Although, what is it? I guess it is a good thing that we got three teams ranked in the MEAC as far as trying. So it does look like one is going to the celebration bowl, and either South Carolina State or BCU will be heading to 
the FCS playoffs. So I guess it's kind of a blessing in disguise that it shows how good the MEAC is. Yes, it does. And so, um, for time constraints, we're gonna go ahead and jump over to the MEAC. I'm sorry for this to the SEAC, uh, so we can talk about the wonderful football in Conference SEAC. Uh, the SEAC championship game uh, tickets are on sale. It will be Saturday, November 16th, where the Eastern Division Champions Campus, and that looks to be former MEAC member Savannah State, who's been bullying uh, teams all over the SEAC going back home. Who says you can't go back home and be a winner? Uh, tickets are $20. Um, so come on out uh, to Savannah, Georgia, and see you, Savannah State, vie for a SEAC championship. Now to recap week nine in these SIAC. Now, Ed Waters has been going on a tour of the CA because they are a, a future prospective member of the conference. And they have taken their lumps and taken their lumps, but they almost gave a lump to Tuskegee. It took a missed extra point for Tuskegee to put away Ed Waters. Um, the game ends 27-26. to 26. Keisha, uh, I know I know. you know you, with you being from Alabama and we've been covering Ed Waters for the past two years. What do you think about uh, this Ed Waters versus Tuskegee game being so close with Tuskegee being a team that has been dominant uh, in the past and also in the present? In Division Two football, HBCU football. So you know, first and foremost, those one you know, I'm really bad about those one point games. I uh-huh. really hate those one point losses. Um, and I said this has been a different Tuskegee game, but Tuskegee, uh, this is the same thing with Grambling and Jackson State. Coach Slater is hitting the stride at the right time. He's in the stride at the right time, and it's just showing that he can turn the team around. Because when I look, you know, early in the season, you're talking about one and four. He's about in conference play, but he's start, slowly starting to turn the team around. So I think it just happened at the right time. And like you said, they have been dominant in, in the past, but they have lost a lot of their key players, you know, to graduation or whatever it might be. So, you know, Tuskegee is going to be Tuskegee, and I think as long as Coach Slater is there with that, with what Coach Slater does, they will be fine. P.P., Jen? All right. So oh. – yeah. I'm, I'm you go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. You can go ahead. Okay. I ain't gonna say no. Jen, you have a comment? I said I'm sorry. I was getting a sandwich from Bucky's. Don't mind. You, me you right got now. a sandwich from us? I'm hungry. I had I had to get one from Bucky's. You know, anytime y'all in Texas, y'all got to stop at Bucky's. I stop at Bucky's. <laughs> All right. So moving right along, Lane, I'm um, handled Central State. Let me find that. Uh, and I actually picked Central State to win this game. Uh, Lane improves to three and six, one and four, and Central State drops to three and six, two and three. Um, Lane uh, was led by uh, Tariq McKenzie, who threw for two hundred forty-four yards and four touchdowns. Uh, Kingston Davis, last chance you, former Michigan transfer, uh, ran for 121 yards and one touchdown. I'm glad to see that young man getting a chance to play football and, and be successful. Uh, through the air, uh, Evelyn Anthony Evelyn had eight catches for 145 yards and two touchdowns. For Central State in the loss, uh, Williams completed 8 of 22 passes, 72 yards, one touchdown. He was sacked five times. So that Lane Dragon defensive line uh, was living in the backfield. Uh, Saffo ran for 93 yards and a long one 25 through the air. The Lane boy in the second had 46 yards and one touchdown. Uh, also, uh, Albany State. Uh, defeated Morehouse 21-15, another one of Keisha's teams that she's close with. Keisha, let's talk about Morehouse loss to Albany State. Well, when you look at a, a, a Morehouse and you look at Albany State, we look at where Albany State was last year, totally dominant. And then we see they got to the – they were dominant on the east side. But once you see when they got to the SEAC championship, they totally lost to uh, Miles College. 
Morehouse is not the Morehouse team that we saw last year. Right. Where they started off uh, roughly, they were eight and zero coming into the season, and they kind of t- they hit their 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 stride, and then that at that eighth game, after that eighth game, they just kind of went downhill. And I think everyone is still trying to figure out what exactly it is that Morehouse is doing. Why is Morehouse doing what they're doing? Why is it that Morehouse can't win more games? And it's like, you know, it's the closing that they can't do. They get a late start and they can't get on the – if they didn't get a late start, excuse me, and they can't get on the board, it's the closing that Morehouse isn't doing with their opponents. All right. And for Albany State, Kalias Williams led them with 145 yards passing, two touchdowns. Tracy Scott, uh, 133 yards rushing, one touchdown, followed by McKinley Abrams with 85 yards. Through the air, Albany State was led by Rashad Jordan with 54 yards Christian Grant had 43 yards and two touchdowns. For Morehouse, Michael Sims, 115 yards passing, two touchdowns. Santo Dunn had 91 yards rushing. And the final score of this game was, of course, Morehouse 15, Albany State 21. And Miles, last year's champion, blanks Kentucky State. Miles now sits at 7-2. 4 and 1 in the conference. Kentucky State falls to 5 and 3, 2 and 3, 4 miles. Um, they were led by Daniel Smith, 122 yards passing and two touchdowns, one pick, followed up by Dante Elvis, 82 yards rushing, and then Justin Reed, 7 yards rushing. Through the air, Miles was led by Leonard Tyree and Cohen Hudson, 36 yards and 26 yards with Hudson having a touchdown. For Kentucky State, not much offense through the air. We know this is a rushing team. This is a team that ran all over Jackson State. Uh, Jalen Miles Myers had 36 yards passing uh, on the ground, total 116 yards, total rushing. Um, Brett Sylvie had 67 of those, 116 yards of rushing. Um, now we're going to jump over to Savannah State versus Fort Valley State. This is a game. Um, that uh, I, I pegged as the SEAC game of the week, and it was not close. Savannah State <laughs> scored 27 points in the first quarter, and they could have stopped scoring, and they still would have beaten Fort Valley State, who only scored 24 total points in the game. So a 53-24 to beatdown for Fort Valley State over. I'm sorry, for Fort Valley State losing to Savannah State. Um, statistics in this game, uh, Devon Givens uh, threw for 75 yards and four touchdowns. They lived on the ground this game. D'Angelo Durham ran for 148 yards, two touchdowns. Devon Givens, 145 yards, two touchdowns through the air. Enoch Carter, oh, I like that. It's kind of nice. Enoch Carter, Major Bellamy, Zionte Devereaux, and Jonte Baker each had touchdowns. Uh, for Fort Valley State through the air. Uh, DeMonte Jones threw for 292 yards, three touchdowns, two picks. Uh, not much on the ground for Fort Valley State, but through the air. Uh, Shamar Bridges had seven catches for 129 yards. A.J. Shipman, Jeffrey Mack, and Qua Walker each had touchdowns. Keisha, Savannah State, uh, beating up on Fort Valley. What do you think about this? Savannah State is a team right now that is pretty lethal to what they're doing. And it's so funny because you're coming back to the SEAC from the MEAC. You're coming in and you're totally dominating the opponents. You're beating up on everybody in the conference. And the funny thing is they said at, at um, media day they would, and nobody believed them. Nobody believed them at all. They said they would do what they were going to do, and nobody believed anything they said. Everybody laughed at them. Of course, they, they put – um, you know, yeah, they, they, were, put, they were pick uh, last. They will pick last. Correct. Correct. So, you know, they said, again, they said they were going to do what they were going to do, and nobody believed that they would come in and play how they're playing. And with Coach Sean Quinn um, for Savannah State, even looking at last week's game against Coach, uh, Coach, I call him Coach G, Coach Giordano, Wyoming State. It's, it's it's just crazy because who would have picked? But someone was saying who would have thought this team that was the door he called it the doormat of the MEAC would come in 
and do what they're doing in the SEAC in Savannah State. And I told him, I was like, well, maybe you just got to know your lane. Maybe you shouldn't have been over there in the first place. <laughs> but they are doing what they need to do over here in the SEAC. They, they beating up the opponents over here. Different brand of football, though, you know, with Division One, Division Two. So, um, correct. So we're gonna jump over to the CIAA. You know, one of my favorite HBCU squads. Mine is my favorite player. Is still dominant in the CIAA. I am talking about the Bowie State Bulldogs. Um, so let's talk about the CIAA. All right, Let me get this pulled up here. All right, so in this week's games, Bowie State, uh, ranked number 15 in Division Two football, blew out Lincoln, Pennsylvania. It was good to see Lincoln, Pennsylvania try and fight back. Um, they did score 20 points, but it was definitely not enough um, to overtake Bowie State. Um, Boy State, Bowie State quarterback Jerome Johnson went 13 for 17, 160 yards and two touchdowns. No Amir Hall, no problem. Keisha. What do you think about this whooping that Bowie State put on Lincoln? I'm not surprised. That's all <laughs> I got. I'm not surprised. All right. And now Virginia State beats up on Chawan. I, lo- I like that. I'm glad you – I'm glad because I, I was saying I was calling that, that school all around. I love how that school the school is pronounced Chawan. All right. Virginia State defeats Chawan 2021. They keep their Division Two playoff hopes alive with the road win. After they scored the first quarter, the Trojan went up 14 points. On a touchdown run by Terrell Wallace. Uh, later in the third quarter, Darius Haggins would cap a 10 play 61 yard drive with a 9 yard scoring run. Making the score 28 21. A late touchdown by, by Chuan made it 28 21. And that is your final score. Um, Shaw. Blanks, Winston Salem State. I picked Winston Salem State. I'm surprised by that. Kells, what do you think about Shaw shutting out Winston Salem State? I mean, and I, I looked. I looked at that earlier. Um, I don't know what I predicted, but I can't believe they completely blanked them twenty-one to zero. That's what what I did. And on top of this, uh, this was Winston Salem's homecoming. So this was their homecoming. Um, this also this also puts uh, Shaw still in the hunt for the yes. Southern Division title. Exactly. So Virginia Union defeats Elizabeth City State. Uh, 26 to 19. Uh, Fairville State blanks Livingstone 32 to 0. Johnson C. Smith defeats St. Augustine 26 to 17. And for the final couple minutes, we want to talk about the CIAA. Um, as far as, like Kel said, still in the hunt. Let me pull these standings up. Because right now, Bowie State has clinched the Northern Division. They stand at 4-1. They have beaten both Virginia State and Virginia Union, followed up by Elizabeth City State 1-3. Chawan 1-3, and Lincoln stands defeated. Now, in the Southern Division, it's still a three-man race, even though Winston Salem State got blanked by Shaw. You have three teams who both sit at 3-1. That'd be Fayetteville State, Shaw, Winston Salem State, followed up by St. Hawks 2-2. John C. Smith, 1-3. Livingstone, 0-4. Oh, After a promising start, they falter in the CIAA. Kells, let's talk about this three-man race for the Southern Division. Who you pick? Who you think going to win out? My favorite is for Fayetteville what? State. Agree. Same. Same. All right. So, um, you know, I guess we have to see if we're correct on that. But that's to run down the rest of the scores. Or in HBCU football before chaos gets us out of here. Uh, West Virginia State falls to University of Charleston 49 to 24. Fort Hayes State beat up on Lincoln, Missouri 66 to 6. Uh, Hampton defeated Pres- Pres- Presbyterian 40 to 17. I don't know why people picked Presbyterian to beat up on Hampton. They ain't really won a game all year, I don't think. I went and looked at their schedule. I was like, hmm, I'm not picking Presbyterian. What do you think about that, Kels? I, yeah. Hampton, <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I don't. Hampton, I don't sometimes the thing is, I think people don't really understand the teams that are up against each other they don't study the teams they don't know the teams they haven't heard of the teams so therefore they don't know what the stats are they don't know who the teams are so they kind of pick against the odds is what's Mm -hmm. happening in this case all right 
Tennessee State falls to Southeast Missouri State, 32-13. to But uh, wide receiver Stephen Newbo, if you go look at Black House, Black House Experience Facebook page, I shared a video of Stephen Newbo's amazing Odell Beckham-like one-handed catch in the losing effort. It's amazing. Go check it out. Uh, they fall to Southeast Missouri State, 32-13. to Oh, I forgot one school in in in, uh, in the SEAC. Benedict uh, defeated Clark Atlanta. I guess I didn't scroll down far enough. They beat up on Clark too. Tough, tough season for the new head coach at Clark, but I'm pretty sure he's going to get things turned around, hopefully get that team playing more competitively. Uh, Texas College takes one on the takes one on the head from Bethel, 51 to 14. Langston bounced back after losing last week. They defeated Sag U. 21 to 14. And I want to congratulate Jamie Sanders for being the Black College Experience Week 10 HBCU College Football Week 10 champion. So I'm going to add him to my winners group. And then I'm going to be getting ready to uh, do my raffle. Uh, we're going to give away a couple of gift cards. I want to thank everybody for playing. And we're going to come back next year with this thing as well. Uh, that's all I have. Kels, you want to go ahead and uh, close us out? All right, so, it, again, it has been a great weekend yes. in, in black college sport. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in and rolling with me. Um, I'm here still in Baton Rouge, so I'm going to get up out of Baton Rouge. Sometime early in the morning, I am I'm surprised my eyes are still open. I'm just that tired. I'm super tired right now. But it, it, it was it was it was a great weekend again in Baton Rouge. It was a great week for me, rather I say, because I've been here since Wednesday. Great time. Um, again, I'm, I'm beyond moves with all the stuff that we've done this week. Um, me being honored as a 40 under 40, um, it's, it's just been a lot. It's been a lot of stuff that we've been doing, moving mm-hmm. stuff, raising money, doing a bunch of stuff. People raised wearing over black college experience getting at the homecoming too, Kels. I took a picture it, of a it, guy. It is. It's it's just uh, it's just been a lot, and so coming up um, not next week, but on November 11th, of course, we will kick off the 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 coat drive that we're partnered with Mustard Seed Barbecue um, to do. Also, we're getting ready to do, and I wasn't gonna break this, but I may as well break it now. It's gonna just gonna be a sh- it's gonna be like a short series, trying to put it all together now, working on the production of it now, of the builds of a Bayou Classic. So it's going to run it like two weeks to build up a Bayou Classic, the coaches, the bands, the raggedy mascots, the team, that you are everything that goes into Bayou Classic. You, you notice I said the raggedy mascots because I don't like the mascots. Everything that goes into the Bayou Classic, <laughs> the history. And Jen, no, I, I forgot about it. I don't like, I don't like mascots. I hate them. I At really all. Hate she them. I, hate, I hate them. They could take them out of the game. They, can, they, they don't have to be there. But uh, absolutely, no, no, we are. No. We're, we're going to build it up to start off with Bayou Classic, and I think next year maybe go into Magic City Classic. Because with these games, we have to let people know, even though we know the tradition of them, a lot of people that never been, it's a lot of people that are talking about Magic City Classic, they've never been to Magic City Classic. People that are talking about Bayou Classic, they've never been to Bayou Classic. Jen and I have been to both, so we know. We've been to both hey. games, so we understand it. We can talk Thanks. about them because we've been to both of them over and over again. But that's enough of my rent. That's enough of my rent. That's all I got. Yes, indeed. Well, we want to thank you all for listening. And Jamie Sanders, I'm going to be getting in touch with you so that we can add you to my winners group so that we can put you in so we can get you raffled up. So watch out, look out for week 11 coming out on Tuesday. Like I said, I want to thank everybody for playing. That is all we have for tonight. Catch you next week. Black College Experience. We out of here. Good night.